the very first recording of an off-axis hologram was uh, made in uh, March 1961 and um, at that time um, we didn't have a laser, so many mercury arc lamps and semi-coherent light sources and Emmett was writing his uh, uh, paper communication theory and optics and uh, making some uh, photographic uh, illustrations and uh, the one we couldn't do was to de demonstrate the off-axis hologram <coughs> but then I was in the laboratory looking at the uh, paper, there was a paper that described how uh, Ronke ruling when it imaged and when you change, uh, blocked some of the diffracted lines in the transform plane that it changed the sharpness and how the image changed. And so while looking at that, I thought, well, what happens if I select only two points from those um, over 10 diffracted spots? And of course, there was, looked like interference lines, and it was very contrasty all across the field. So um, then I selected these two points and uh, placed a very fine copper wire near just uh, near the focus point just where before the two beams overlapped and then made a recording in the image plane. So that was the first off-axis hologram. Um, then in uh, 1962 we tried to make uh, some more holograms and then the first laser came around and uh, we had uh, my colleague um, Bud Wunderlut had uh, managed to buy one of the first lasers which was really expensive something like ten thousand dollars and uh, he was in the adjoining room so <coughs> we put in a mirror and uh, borrowed the beam <coughs> to our uh, optical bench in the adjoining room and then with that we could make the first uh, holograms of transparencies uh, of continuous tone transparencies and uh, those were published in the uh, second paper uh, when this uh, paper appeared in uh, December 19, let's see, 1963 um, the uh, uh, Physical Society of America uh, released a press release about the holograph, holograms and uh, Emmett received many telephone calls inquiring about it was kind of headline was lensless photography something like that and um, when he answered the interviews uh, he uh, added by the way, that uh, we could also record three-dimensional objects or images and uh, the uh, reporters certainly didn't believe it. They asked if he, that he had done it and he hadn't, but he kind of said, well, it was obvious that you could do that. But uh, they certainly doubted that, so in their reports they never mentioned that holograms were three-dimensional, could record three-dimensional images. Right after that, we immediately went to the lab and started to set up to record a reflective hologram of this uh, little train that we borrowed from one of our technicians in the laboratory. And um, at first, we didn't get any results. The, there were stability problems and the beams were being not equalized reference and object beams were not equalized. So at first, we just got blank films but then uh, in, uh, at the, in the last week of December 1963, we finally succeeded in making one good hologram, a uh, four by five inch hologram of this little train. Uh, and uh, we were really excited to see that because it was so realistic, even though it's, we knew it should be realistic, but it was something else to see it. And then once, uh, uh, we saw it that we also started showing other our colleagues in the laboratory and, and then the management. So we had a continuous stream of people coming and looking at this uh, first hologram.
This guy. This is what we used to do on a, on a table that was like four feet by eight feet or five by ten or I don't know what it was, but it was huge sandbox. And uh, the sandbox then allowed us to sink things in and lock them down. But it, the problem with the sandbox is sand and it's dirty and it affects the optics, right? And you can see that the laser is a glowing tube and it's a tube that is really composed of neon neon gas with a dose of helium that's why it's called a helium neon laser there we go but shortly a couple years after and with this continuous wave laser you were able to make holograms, transmission holograms like Letha Nupatniks did using a borrowed beam of a continuous wave laser. So I used this beam splitter essentially to split the beam in half. Part of it is here. There, yeah. See? Yeah. The beam comes through and part of it is reflected here. Can you get that in a picture? Yep. And this laser is essentially a spectrophysics model and its output is rated about 15 milliwatts and you can run it hot like we did 20 milliwatts. And you know what I found really cool is that when this sucker fired up it was just like the same laser we used at Visual Alchemy in the 1970s 47 years ago so if it was 1974 and you saw what some of the sandbox optics were 1974 we had a, a big sandbox 8 feet by 4 feet at Visual Alchemy okay. and we had this laser tube and that was a long you know that was a tough way to make make holography and then put it on display <clears throat> which meant that we had to have little lasers for illuminating the transmission holograms for display and you could only afford so many of them so from transmission holograms which are my favorite we went to reflection holograms which were the Denisiuk method the Russian method developed and uh, then we, we used uh, theater lights spotlights okay. Big kick-ass spotlights. So this beautiful little helium neon laser. Now it's without its cover, so we can see the tube. Is going to be sold as an antique, but fuck, it's like the kind of antique that Michelangelo might have used to chisel his, you know, <laughs> David, right? Yeah. Here's the hammer that Michelangelo used. Here's the laser that Sharon McCormick used in her lab. And presumably Lloyd Cross used. It's almost exactly the same as the one that Al Rizzutis used in Visual Alchemy in the same 70s. <laughs> Very <laughs> piece cool. Of history. Very cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a cool. wonderful invention. And now, you know, lasers are used everywhere. When you scan a barcode, you got a laser.